Gearhead science has shown that the DNA of the muscle car is a combination of the cubic inch chromosome with the burning rubber gene. And whenever muscle cars gather, you can be sure that high horsepower is in high demand. Today, the American Muscle Car Museum shares its incredible collection with Topcoat's magnificent machines. Welcome to Top Coats Magnificent Machines, where we're crisscrossing the country looking for the best of the best and the coolest of the cool. On this episode, we're in Melbourne, Florida at the American Muscle Car Museum. Check out these four GTs. Pick your favorite, this one is mine right here. And through these doors, over 300 of the coolest cars on the planet. We're gonna pick our favorites and find out how this place came to be. We're here with Mark Pylock, who owns the collection. Mark, this is spectacular. A giant place for a giant collection. Uh, it's a 123,000 square foot facility uh, built on a 42 acre site. Uh, the uniqueness of this collection, the building itself sits in is 100% solar powered. The collection is about 50% General Motors, about 30% Ford Mercury Shelby, 10% Mopar and 10% other. Uh, and the collection spans from 1955 through 2019. So the beauty of the collection is we have older American muscle cars and then we have newer American muscle cars. Uh, the favorite car I've had is my 1966 427 Shelby Cobra. I've had it now for over 10 years. Uh, it was bought as a high school graduation present. Now that was one hell of a great dad to buy his son a car like that way back in 1966. Uh, and the son proceeded to take that car to Iowa to go to school. The unique twist in the story, 1968, Chevrolet was hyping their new Corvette. So, so he went down to his local Chevy dealership there in Iowa, traded his 1966 427 Shelby Cobra, and like he says, that was probably the worst decision I ever made in my life. Uh, so very interesting history, very great vehicle, uh, sounds great, and a uh, fun vehicle to get in for a ride. Now this car is really unique, it's a one of one. Uh, this is the last surviving factory prototype that Shelby American built as a GT350. Uh, they built 10 factory prototypes. The first nine were actually destroyed by Ford Motor Company. The reason it survived is because good old Carroll Shelby. He had received a letter from Ford Motor Company that said that when the last factory prototype, this vehicle, comes back off the new car show circuit, he had to notify Ford Motor Company in writing that the car was back at his California facility. When this car came back on the weekend, on a Saturday, he did what he had to do. He proceeded to sell that car, though, to a good friend of his a Saturday afternoon. And the gentleman immediately then took the vehicle out of the state of California and titled it in Nevada. Thus, this car actually survived. So a uh, very unique car, one of one, very unique history, um, and a very striking car in 1965. One of the wonders of the American Muscle Car Museum is that you can learn about major and minor differences between cars. The 1969 Boss 302 Mustang and the 1969 Boss 429. It's so cool to have them side by side so you can compare all the little differences. Things from the scoop on the rear quarter panel that wasn't on the 302 that is on the 429, or minor things. Under the hood, the shock tower of the 429 has been totally modified to fit this gigantic engine. It is really minor, but you get the chance to notice, and that's what I love. We still have plenty more to come on Top Coat's Magnificent Machines, including a look at when NASCAR brought racing style to the streets. We'll be right back. 
Top Coat's Magnificent Machines is brought to you by rockauto.com. All the parts your car will ever need. Borla, the world's most winning exhaust. And by Top Coat. Don't just coat it, top coat it. Welcome back to Top Coat's Magnificent Machines here at the American Muscle Car Museum in Melbourne, Florida. This is a magnificent machine. The Dan Gurney Special, it's a Mercury Cyclone spoiler, but really what it is is the beginnings of aerodynamics really factoring into racing. And what they did for the high banks of Daytona and Talladega was extend this front end and get the front nose a little bit lower so that the air would flow over the car. And this caused other manufacturers to step up their game. This is what NASCAR really needed at the time. You take a 1969 Dodge Daytona, you've got an 18 inch nose, you've got fender scoops on the front fenders, and you got a two foot wing on the back to hold the car down. I mean, this had the stance, this had the looks, and it had the performance on it. They had to produce at least 500 to be eligible for NASCAR racing, and there was 503 produced. This car here is done in a Hemi Orange. This is actually the 440 with the 375 horse into a Hurst shifted four speed. Back in the day, if you said her shifted, that meant something. This was actually purchased brand new by a school teacher. He actually drove this car until 1981. It was his daily driver and actually took it to Florida for a family trip and a vacation. He then sold the car, believe this or not, for $160. And then the car was restored. It went through several different owners before the museum had purchased it in 2009. This car is a lot of fun to drive. And this gets a lot of attention in the museum, especially for the Mopar fans. Just over a decade later, this is a Charger. 1983, 107 horsepower, but it does have Carroll Shelby's name on it. Lee Iacocca and Shelby reunited to try to raise Chrysler's game, and this is the result. The museum is lit by thousands of high-powered LEDs, but when the main lights go off, your attention is drawn to the numerous neon lights that cover all four walls. Some are familiar, and some are obscure. In the 1950s, if you wanted a stylish pickup, this Ranchero might have been for you, but if you needed to work, and you needed a work truck, there was a rare option. This is a 1957 Mercury M100 pickup truck. In 1957, for $1,789 plus options would buy you one of these. These were produced in Canada, which added to the rarity of it, and they would come down usually through the oil fields in North and South Dakota, because this was actually a workhorse truck. Uh, this particular truck has a straight six, 223 cubic inch, 139 horsepower. This is actually done in a colonial white, in a Cumberland green, a lot of chrome across the front on it. One of the options on this was a heater. Of course, coming from Canada, you'd like to have that. The M100 badge was produced up until 1968. And from then on, you would see like the Ford would be the bigger brother and the F100 or the F150. But just a gorgeous, good looking truck. A tribute to the 1966 Le Mans when the GT40 got the job done. Even a little accommodation for the tall driver with a helmet, a little bubble top, a little extra room. And it's not the only car in the museum that has a bubble top either. Nineteen and sixty-one Pontiac Ventura. This is a bubble top version of the car. What it refers to is this long back glass, and and it it does kind of look like a little bubble sitting on the car. This particular car is done in a in a bamboo with a cream top on it. Has the factory bucket seats. It is a numbers matching car. Frame off restoration. They only did this kind of deal for 61, 62, and uh, at the time they were real unusual. You know, uh, cars up to that period of time didn't have that bubble topped flow or that line. And uh, of course, consequently, you know, now they're a very desirable car. So, uh, but yeah, back in the day, they were, they were definitely unique and uh, sold a lot of cars. Here at the museum, they have all kinds of cool bikes as well, like these Schwinn's, banana seat, high handlebars, definitely the child version of the chopper. But what do they say? The difference between men and boys is the price of their toys? That's what I'm looking at. I love these Ferraris. Stay tuned for more of Top Coat's Magnificent Machines because we have a trio of Trans Ams with some fascinating tales to tell. 
Welcome back to Top Coats Magnificent Machines. They have got a new Bandit Trans Am. Well, honey, hush. Too bad they don't have a hat. Oh, look at that. Yes, they do. I feel like the man himself. And this one was autographed by Bert. I feel his spirit in the cockpit of this car. But this isn't the only car here at the museum that's got a Hollywood connection. Uh, the vehicle behind us is a 1957 Hudson Hollywood Hornet. They only made 483 of these ever. Uh, but this car is actually, uh, from a styling point of view, really striking. But the uniqueness of the Hudson is that it had the fold-down front seat into a bed. Of course, it didn't turn out to be the success that they had hoped. A little over a year ago, we had a private tour that we were given here at the American Muscle Car Museum. Within this private tour, a lady, I'm going to guess, was about 80 years old. She came around the corner, and she goes, oh my god, oh my god, is, is that a 57 Hudson? Is that a 57 Hudson? And she turned to the crowd, and she goes, look, I got a lot of action in that front seat of that 57 Hudson. That lady, for the rest of the evening, she was running laps around this building. So that's what a lot of these old cars are, a lot of memories. When you take in the entire American Muscle Car Museum collection, it's easy to forget that virtually every car has an interesting pedigree or backstory. Trans Am 1972 455HO. It caught my eye immediately, but the story is even better. It's one of one with the code 24 Adriatic Blue. And of course, its nickname is Adrian. The story behind it was found in Texas. It was being used to herd dairy cows. It was all kinds of damage, and they brought it back to life. The thing is amazing. It's one of one, but it's not the only one of one here in this museum. This is a very unique and rare Trans Am. It's a one-of-one one car, and let me give you a little history behind it. Mike Carcella had a friend that had a 74 Super Duty. He was actually a Pontiac dealer's son, and he wanted to be top dog. He got together with Don Yanko, and he says, I want a Yanko Trans Am. So Don Yanko put his own personal touch on this car. He installed an L88 crate motor, a four-speed transmission, and added a 410 gear, and it has a unique Yanko badging on it. The really nice part about this car is this is an unrestored original car, about 13,000 miles on it. A lot of fun to drive, fast car, makes a lot of noise. Got a whole lot of rubber on this car. One of the modifications is actually added subframe connectors, a roll bar behind the front seat there. And we got a nice big BF Goodrich radial TAs on the back of this car to hook the power to the ground. And of course, with that Yanko name, it brings a little oomph to it. It's a hell of a good car. We all love our cars. We love to take care of them. We want them to look their best. And now with F11, a product like that, you can do it a lot faster with better results. You can literally do any car you have, especially an investment grade car such as this. Yeah, I mean, here we are with one of the most highly sought after collectible cars in the world. And you know, when I look at this car and I realize all the advantages and benefits that Top Cut F11 does to this thing, I mean, we're talking, even this motor, F11 is safe when it comes to engines, motors, belts, anything in there. Even your hoses, it, it won't, it won't basically whiten it like other products will. So again, very effective, very safe. You take that thought and you go to even these exhausts. I mean, you notice these beautiful exhausts on the side and the headers that are exposed. Top coat is wonderful for that, and it also prevents any kind of bluing. I mean, even interiors, right, Mike? Yeah, it'll protect it from sun damage, especially harmful UV rays. Yeah, that's right. You know, and yeah. sun will destroy Which things. Which is a killer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like the, the acrylic and all the plastic I, and I all was, that. I was just noticing yeah. this. These are acrylics. I mean, you got glass, you got chrome, but look at this. I mean, this is actually, you know, authentic acrylic pieces that you got to make sure that what you put on that is going to literally protect it, not yellow it protect it. Right, and that's the key. You want to protect it without harming it long term. That's right. And we have years of experience on multi-million dollar investment cars yeah. and even daily drivers. Daily drivers. I mean, testimonials, you know, I, I joke about it, but it's true because it's amazing. Five years, 10 years, 18 years of testimonials that pour in of Top Coat F11 maintaining cars in this condition, period. Yeah, Top Coat just makes life so much easier, makes everything yeah. look so much better. So to learn more, go to topcoat.tv.
One of the most impressive sections of the collection is devoted to the cars that led the greatest spectacle in racing. That and much, much more when Topcoat's Magnificent Machines returns. Topcoat's Magnificent Machines is brought to you by Magic Creeper, the most versatile creeper ever. Custom Auto Sound, the originator of classic car OEM fit radio since 1977. And by Top Coat, the best coatings in the world. Welcome back to Top Coat's Magnificent Machines here at the American Muscle Car Museum in Melbourne, Florida. We've come over to the maintenance shop here at the American Muscle Car Museum, and this is Todd McCarty. Todd, as soon as I walk in, I see a Buick Regal GNX, not just the Grand National, the GNX, the king of them all. So why did they do it, though? What was the point of Buick making this turbocharged beast? I'm the head of Buick, he uh, wanted to create a Corvette killer, and he did. It's a 3.8 liter V6, and then they put a Garrett turbocharger on it. It's one of those cars, I mean, if you're a true drag racer at heart, you're, this is the car you want because you can take it to the grocery store. You can race your buddy from stoplight to stoplight and it has a sound where you feel like you're at the track and you're not. So it's, it's a great car. So how many miles on this one? This car has a giant, huge, double digit amount of 14. This is a perfect yeah, car, 14 yeah, miles. Perfect. The key word to this amazing collection is American and nothing is more patriotic than the annual 500-mile race held every year in Indianapolis. Back in the day, the Pace car was an innovative new model. Everybody used to show up in town at that local dealership, whether it be a Ford or a Chevy or whatever the brand may be, because they wanted to see what was brand new. Uh, so the Pace car back in the early years, in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s and 80s, it was still a very unique model. The first Pace car in this incredible collection is this 1955 Bel Air convertible. Jerry, this car obviously caused a stir. It did. This was the first year for the famous shoebox group of cars, the 55, 56, 57s. Uh, it also brought out the 265 V8 motor, first year for Chevrolet to, to put a V8 out. The National Classic Chevy International Show, this particular car s scored 998 out of 1,000. So it was two points out of being perfect. Nice car. Nice car, but this is just first of many. When the Mustang first came out, it changed the world, and of course, it led the field at the Indy 500. Well, just a couple years later, in 1967, it was Camaro's turn with this beautiful 67 convertible. Jerry, tell me about this car. This car was one of 104 at the Indy in 1967. The car's done in an ermine white. It's a bright blue interior. Great combination, just lights up the whole car. Extreme blue, more Extreme, blue than any yeah, other blue I've ever exactly. seen. Exactly. Camaro's first year, you know, they, they, made a, they made a splash when they went. The first Camaro to pace the race, but it wouldn't be the last. Now we're moving into the 1970s. 1970 to be specific, the 54th Indy 500, the muscle car era still going, and this old's super cool. Super cool 1970 Olds, and this is the first year since 1960 that Oldsmobile paced the lap. And they actually had four in the, in the 70s. They had a 70, 72, 74, and a 77. Great car, good looking car, represents American muscle well. The 70s in the rearview mirror, let's move on to the 80s. The year is 1984. Ronald Reagan is president, and this Pontiac Fiero paced the Indy 500. Andrew Mackey is here. Andrew, tell us a little bit more about this Pontiac. Yeah, this would be the first year for the Fiero. Ended up going four years. Very innovative car for the time. Would be the first four-cylinder car to pace a race since 1912. Four-cylinder, that's unusual, but also mid-engine. Engine behind the driver, just like all the Indy cars. Yeah, the original street car would have a two and a half liter four-cylinder. A um, little under 100 horsepower, but for track duty, they need to beef that up. It was increased to 2.7 liters and over 200 horsepower. Indy 500, so cool. Let's move on to the next decade. Not a lot of Dodges pacing the ND500. In 1991, it was supposed to be a Dodge Stealth, but that was a cross-platform car with Mitsubishi. And the United Auto Workers were like, American race, we want an American car. So instead, they used the first ever Dodge Viper prototype, and Carroll Shelby drove it. A Couple years later, this actual production car paced the race. 
Yeah, for 1996, they brought out the second generation Viper. Um, this is a GTS model. Previous generations were all RT10s, so they would have all been convertible. So this is a first year hardtop. They also upped the horsepower to 450, up from 400, so really good choice for a pace car. Now let's move on to the next century. The vehicle right behind me is actually a 2001 Olds Bravada. Um, at that time in America, the SUV was becoming more and more popular. And in 2001, it actually became the official Indianapolis pace car. Of course, it wasn't a pace car. It was the pace SUV. So it's time to wrap up this episode with our Top Coats Top Pick. And how can we not be impressed by the Shelby 427 Cobra? Its appearance and performance are amazing. And that deep midnight blue paint scheme make it obvious why this car was the stuff of dreams back in the 60s. This American Muscle Car Museum sure has been great. I've had a lot of fun, but you might have noticed, no Chevrolets, and that is for a reason. If this 69 Z28 is any indication, we're gonna have ourselves a great time. It has been so cool to see all these cars. Now I want you to know, Chevy fans, we got something for you. We're gonna have a great time next week. It's gonna be awesome. Great cars, great people, great place. Top Coats, magnificent machines. We will see you next week.